In learning objective number four, we're going to look at variability of returns, the second lesson. How do these returns vary over time? And what are some good measures of variability statistically? Can we use statistics to measure uh, variability of these financial instruments? Uh, some of these returns and some of these financial instruments, and can we use statistics to make good financial decisions? Very simply, we can put uh, all of these um, returns that Ibbotson and Sinkfeld have gathered from 1926 to 2013 into uh, what I'll call a frequency distribution. Um, you may have learned in stat class, this is also called a histogram, and all it does is count the number uh, I call it a bucket diagram. All, uh, how many returns fit into each and one of those buckets? From minus 15 to 5, minus 5, we see 11 returns. And from minus 5 to 5%, we see 8 returns and so on. Just throw the um, individual returns into these buckets, and you'll see kind of a almost a normal distribution start to take place. Uh, again, these are the statistics that use Ibbotson and Sinkfeld study from 1926 to 2013. Uh, from that, we can calculate all kinds of statistics, and uh, some of the more popular ones are the variance and standard deviation, so we're going to go through how to do that. Uh, variance is uh, simply the average square difference between the actual return and the average return, and the um, standard deviation is the square root of the variance, positive square root of the variance. So some key ideas here, the greater the variance, the greater the standard deviation the greater the volatility of the instrument, and high volatility increases a chance that a year's return will be far different than the average return. Again, we can see on this chart that uh, T-bills don't vary very much. They vary somewhere between uh, 0 and 14.6% over time. They never go below the line negatively. They have the smallest standard deviation and the smallest uh, variance of all the instruments that Ibbotson and Sinkfeld studied. Let's look at how to calculate standard deviation and uh, variance. And when we do this, we can repeat this for any instrument uh, over any sub-segment of years. Uh, here's an example, SuperTech and HyperDrive. The SuperTech, uh, HyperTech, HyperDrive companies have the following returns uh, in the last four years. So you just see what the numbers are, what's the average return, uh, what is the variance, what's standard deviation, which one is more volatile. Uh, simply to get the average, I add up all the returns and divide by n. So if I have four returns, I add them all up and divide by four to get the average. And the variance is the uh, sum of the square deviations divided by t minus one observations. So let's take a look at it for uh, just one of them. Let's do uh, super tech. Add up, so uh, it's basically a six-step process. We want to, uh, a five-step process, I'm sorry, with six steps. The first thing we're going to do is change all of our percentages to decimals. So make sure you do that. Work in decimals. Make yourself a note of that. Uh, so we're going to change the minus 20% to minus 0.2, the 50% to 0.5, the 30% to 0.3, and the 10% to 0.1. <clears throat> so step zero, change everything to decimals. Step one add up all the returns and calculate the average. Okay, so I'm going to add the four returns up and get 0.7 <clears throat> and divide by four and I get an average of 0.175. Step number one, uh, calculate the average return. <clears throat> Step number two, calculate the deviation. Take the actual minus the average and then watch your sign and calculate the deviation. So it's column one minus column two in this case. And just be careful, watch your sign. So minus 0.2 minus 0.175 is minus 0.375. 0.5 minus 0.175 is 0.325 and so on down the column. Uh, you can do the math. Just be careful of your sign. Note that your sum of the deviations, when I add down that column, should be zero. So if I've done my math max correctly, the sum of my deviations should be equal to zero. <clears throat> Step number two, calculate deviation. Step number three, square the deviations to eliminate the negatives and uh, sum those square deviations up. So step number three, I'm going to take um, minus 0.375 and square it, uh, 0.325 and square it, 0.125 and square it, and so on. And notice on the right, on the far right column in these uh, square deviations, I get very large number of decimal places. So six or eight decimal places uh, is a good place to be. And add all those up. So sum those square deviations, and that is step number three to, toward calculating the variance and then finally standard deviation. So for super tech variance, I'll take the sum of the square deviations, uh, 0.2675, and I'll divide that by t minus one observation. So if we have four observations, I'm going to divide that by three, since it's a small sample. Uh, 
and I get a, um, a variance of 0 0.0892. 0 0.0892, and then to get standard deviation, I get uh, the square root of 0 0.0892, 29.87%. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, there, that indicates to us that super tech is a highly volatile investment, it has a high standard deviation, high variance, higher than hyperdrive. You notice we did the same calculations for hyperdrive. And um, super tech in this case has the high standard deviation, is more volatile. If indeed uh, the frequency distribution uh, does take on a normal uh, distribution form, which as you add more and more data points to each of these uh, uh, data points in the study of Ibbotson and Sinkfeld, it will start to look more and more normal. We can make some assumptions and we can calculate certainly the standard deviation and the variance. Once we have the average and the standard deviation, we know that uh, plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean, 68% of all future returns will fall within that, uh, or about two-thirds. Uh, you may hear uh, some books uh, talk about 66%, 68%, 69%, somewhere in that ballpark. About two-thirds of all future returns will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean if we have a, a fairly normal distribution. Uh, also, we know from statistics that there's a 95% chance that uh, any future outcome will fall within two standard deviations of the mean and a 99% chance that um, an outcome in the future will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. So these are just common statistics that you learn in your stack class, maybe your econ class, maybe even your psych class. They also pertain in finance too. If I have an average and I have a standard uh, deviation, I can calculate uh, potential outcomes. So lesson number two in uh, variability in lessons from market history, the uh, reward for bearing risk is large. Bearing risk is handsomely rewarded, but in a given year, there's a significant chance of a dramatic change in value. So uh, high risk, high return is one thing we have learned from this chapter. In example 12.3, we're going to use these uh, statistics that we've learned um, to figure out if a, an investment is appropriate for widows and orphans. What's the approximate probability that you will actually lose more than 15% of your money in one year if you buy a portfolio of high growth, uh, stocks, small company stocks. Now, we know from Ibbotson and Sinkfeld's study that uh, the average return on small company growth stocks is about 17%. 16.9% is the mean with a standard deviation of 32.3%. And if these data points show a normal distribution, we know that um, plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean, uh, an outcome will fall within that two-thirds of the time. So we can calculate the mean at 16.9% uh, and two thirds of all future um, outcomes will fall within minus 15.4% and 49.2%. So we have to ask ourselves, is this an appropriate investment, small company stocks, for widows and orphans? Um, returns will be below minus 15% or above 49.2%, uh, one out of every three years or one third of the time. And then one sixth of the time, um, returns will be below 15.4%. Is this appropriate for widows and orphans? And the answer is no. That's a pretty volatile investment. A big uh, negative return is not appropriate for widows and or uh, orphans or anyone else who can't afford that risk. So here we use some statistics to make sure we're making good investments.